I'm going to show you an image of a body part and you're going to have three seconds to be able to tell me if it's a right or left body part. Three, two, one, right or left. Jot it down. I'll give you a clue in a second. But you're going to have another go. Different body part or not. Same amount of time. Three, two, one, right or left hand. Now, you will see some similar examples in the workbook of the foot, of the head. And what I'm really asking you there is, if you got that right, it's actually a little bit irrelevant, but if you got that right, how do you know which is your right or left hand? And while intuitively that seems, uh, well, I know this is my left hand, maybe I look at my thumb, what is our true reference point for being able to know left and right beyond just simply being told when we're a kid growing up what is left and right and that's where it takes us into our brain and into a fold within our brain that is in your workbook called the somatosensory cortex and while that sounds like a long and fancy word what this actually is is a virtual representation of every physical part of our body in our brain. It's called the body in mind or another word that we have that you can google is called the homunculus and we've blown him up in the workbook for you to see that he has really big hands, he has a really big face, big feet but then small legs, back and shoulders and the physically very large body parts that we have are small on the body in our mind versus things like our hands and face which are very big and that's really all about how much sensory processing our brain and nervous system puts towards processing the fact that you know we have to taste a lot of things with our tongue we can see what's going on with our eyes we have to be able to hear we we have to be able to process all of that information that means that we are more sensitive in those areas and what would happen to those body parts and I've got an example here, which is the hand, but what would happen to those body parts? Ultimately, what we're talking about here is each one of these is a neuron in the brain, and that's what the smallest, the smallest cell that we're talking about here that is representing each body part. Now, when you thought about, or when you saw that right hand at the start, or you saw the left hand at the start, or you look at your right hand, your right hand in your homunculus, or this body in your mind, would have lit up would have had a little bit of metabolic activity that meant that we caused some activation. Now, these body maps are lit up by both moving the physical body part, but also thinking about the body part. And if we are, if we, for example, had a, an injury where we put our hand in an oven, oven mitt for six months or a cast, then what happens to the virtual representation of our hand becomes less accurate or becomes less blurry. There's, there were some amazing studies, amazing, amazingly awful studies done on monkeys who had their fingers stitched together to be able to see what happens when we stitch, physically stitch body parts together to the um, representation in our brain. And what happens was when they unstitched the monkey's fingers that the two fingers stayed blurred together in terms of the virtual representation in the mind. This is a really important concept for movement, but also has a little bit of relationship to pain because if we don't move a body part for a long period of time, and like you may have not moved your back for a period of time, then it's plausible that the virtual representation of your back has become blurry. Okay, and what happens then is it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that movement of the back then becomes more challenging. You know, this can also then lead to an increased, an, in, an increased detection of threat around where is my body part in space and time. And there's not a really strong relationship with pain, but there is with movement. And that's where this also ties in to hopefully make sense with the things that we've talked about up to this point about pain being an output of the nervous system, not just an input from the body part. Because if you think about an example of phantom limb pain, 
which most people have heard of, but if you haven't, it's where someone would lose a limb, but then would still have pain in that body part, which of course, if we are still processing or thinking about pain as an outward in process, injure the tissue and pain comes in, then phantom limb pain would be unfortunately described as psychological pain or in some way less real than tissue-based pain. Pain is pain. Pain is a, a human, emotional and physical biopsychosocial experience that's individual to you. And when we can appreciate that, when we lose a limb, we still have the virtual representation of that body part, then we can have the experience of phantom limb pain. Now, I'm not an expert in phantom limb pain and I've never actually worked with somebody who has lost their limb and had phantom limb pain, but we have got sections in our workbook where people will try to use therapies like mirror therapy to try and, you know, if I've lost this limb, I can use this hand here, put a mirror here so that my brain and my nervous system is seeing the limb. So ultimately, exercising the virtual representation of the missing limb. So we're exercising that body and the mind. Okay, now we don't have to lose a limb to be able to learn that that's how all of our nervous systems work. To be able to appreciate that we have these virtual representations and that before you started experiencing pain, it's plausible that the, the body and the mind, your virtual representation of your back, of your hips, was sharper when it was being moved more often. Now throughout this program, there is a series of movements that we are doing to be able to explore all of the ranges of movement in the spine, forwards into flexion, backwards into extension, bending sideways, rotation, to try and help rebuild the movement accuracy, not just of your back and your spine, but the virtual representation of your spine. And the intention that you go into the exercises is what this session is about, to give you that real purpose that you're trying to work, not just on the physical, but on the, on the mental component, on the, the homunculus, on your body maps, as we call them. This can also help explain why we may get migrating aches and pains. So when we look at, if you look at the, in your workbook around the different body parts in the homunculus, they are ordered in, in some sort of logic. So the shoulder is next to the elbow, is next to the wrist. And if, for example, in the hand, it's blurry and we're not getting, your brain is not getting clear and accurate information, it will then start looking to the next body part in the mind, which is the elbow, so that we could experience migrating aches and pains that start in the hand, that then move to the elbow, that then move to the shoulder, that otherwise don't seem to make sense. Or you might have back pain that you start feeling in your bum, then you start feeling down your leg, and again, it doesn't make sense until we can maybe look at it through this neurophysiological lens to be able to see that the body and your brain is looking for where is my body in space and time. So how do we go about bringing those maps back into focus? Accurate, mindful movement. And that piece I added on at the end there, mindful, is also important because Arnold Schwarzenegger made famous way back when this whole idea of the mind-muscle connection. He figured out before science and research that if he intensely concentrated on a muscle, he could produce a greater contraction and a greater output in that muscle than purely contracting it alone. He was able to elicit this idea of imagery, around really trying to think about the body part and then being able to light up the virtual representation to be able to work on those body maps, to be able to work on that body part to increase the output. And that could be something that is very, very important for you through this, through this session and through these movements, because it may be that these movements at this point are a little bit too difficult. And for some people, we have to take a step back and to be, be able to use imagery, to be able to grade towards being able to do the physical movements. Okay, so there's a couple of tasks this week that I want you to be able to do. And the first one is going to be to, be to explain this idea of body maps to a friend or a family member to be able to explain that we all have a virtual representation. And if you can explain phantom limb pain, then that's gonna really help this stick with you. And how that we don't have to lose our limb to be able to experience the fact that we have a virtual representation of our body part. And if we don't use it, it becomes less accurate, it becomes blurry, that makes movement going forward more challenging. So 
being able to explain to your family member the accurate movement of the body part or of the spine as you're going to be doing is going to be working on your physical but also the virtual representation. Now if you're so sensitive at this point that the exercises are too challenging, the second task will be for you to take a little bit of quiet space and visualize the movement. Be able to pick a task that is important to you that you currently are maybe unable to do. You know, it could be lifting something up off the floor, it could be getting down to the floor. And being able to imagine and see that movement and run it over in your head in a quiet place. And if it's too challenging, take a step back, do other things and come back to it once you recover. But this is going to be your connection to why you're going to be doing mindful, accurate movements as part of this program.